Thank you for tuning into our podcast. We are coming to you from Chicopee, Massachusetts. I am your host, Carrie, and joining me is Holyoke's very own local historian and creator of the historical tours of Greater Holyoke, Robert Como. He offers both public and private tours, as well as presentations of local canal systems, reservoirs, cemeteries, and churches, as well as various parks and streets in Holyoke, South Hadley, and Chicopee, Mass. Now you actually lead these tours and give these presentations yourself, is that correct? That's right. This is a very unique mill. And so today he'll be educating us on the Springfield Blanket Mill. So tell us about this mill. All right, it was started in the year 1870. It was started by a man named Warren Wilkerson. And he wanted to make blankets, but they weren't ordinary blankets. They weren't blankets for people at all. They were blankets for horses. And there was such a great need for these blankets, he made one million blankets a year out of this whole factory. That's an incredible number. When you may ask, where are all the horses? Well, back in 1870, that was the main source of transportation. And there were 80 million horses in the United States at its peak. <laughs> there might have been more horses than people at one time because they were so useful. And he, of course, they lived outside in barns. They would get cold. And so he made the blankets for them, usually made out of, of wool, bond materials. And I'm going to tell you about Warren, and also I'm going to tell you about how the mill might have changed through time. And you might figure what happened to this kind of mill. You, you don't have as many horses anymore. In fact, there's only one million horses left in the United States. So society has changed greatly. The car has put the car has put the Springfield Blanket Mill out of business, and of course you can see that coming. So tell us about Warren Wilkinson. Right, Warren Wilkinson was the, the president and owner of this company. He ran it from 1870 to his death in 1891. And it, this was the heyday of horse transportation. You would have stagecoaches, you had horse and buggy, you had farm horses, show horses, and so forth. And he loved, sure, making all these blankets, but he also loved living the high life. And that means he bought a lot of land out where Brightside is or where the Providence Hospital is nowadays, the land in front and behind that area. And there he had a gentleman's farm. A gentleman's farm is a farm where they don't grow food for, to eat, where you don't grow animals in order to kill or slaughter them. What you do is you grow the food and animals in order to show them off. So he grew like large vegetables, kind of vegetables you'd bring to a farm expedition during the year and win prizes on it, how large or how nice it was. He grew cattle and horses to, to a high quality to show them off. So he'd go to a farm uh, expedition within New England and show off how wonderful his horses were, how muscular, how fast they were. And the same with cattle. He loved his cattle. He was very similar to William White, who did the same thing on his own gentleman farm in Hoyle. So Warren Wilkinson liked this kind of life. And he did win prizes because I've read stories um, in contemporary newspaper articles about the prizes he had won. He, I think he once grew a watermelon very large, and he had cattle that would win prizes in many expeditions. So quickly before we continue, with the rest of our interview, just to fill our listeners in, if you want to find out more information or sign up for any of his various tours, you can check out his website at hoyocanaltour.org. And there he has both videos of the various stops along each tour and also past and present photos of the historical sites throughout as well. And if you are interested in setting up a private tour, you can email him directly at bobcat4214, capital B, at yahoo.com. And they are perfect for fun and educational and outdoor activities for the whole family or for your group parties, especially those special occasions and get-togethers. And they are also good just for getting outdoors for the day. So getting back to our interview, how did this mill change through time? All right. Now, you might think that this mill wouldn't change through time, and you'd be correct. The, the amount of horses didn't really expand in the United States from 1870 onwards. In fact, um, by the 19 and mid 19 teens and the 1920s, the amount of horses were decreasing. So the physical 
look of the plant didn't change much. And if you look into it, it was located on the third level canal between that canal and the river. The amount of water going down was incredibly high, so it had a lot of water power generation from the turbines that it had in these powerhouses. And it was a mill that had, had a horizontal band parallel to the river and the canal in the very back, but all other elements came forwards from there and were hooked to it in three pieces. There was a right piece, a middle piece, and a left piece. And I'll tell you what each room did. In the very back was a stock house. Um, remember that this is by the, the railroad, and so you could have stock back there coming in and out. Now the right band piece, um, the building back there was numbered mill number one, mill number two, and mill number three as you come forwards. And these mills were production mills, of course. And in each one of them, you did different things. And production is done from the top floor downwards. So you bring the material upwards, do something new, and they come down with it, and come down with it, and so forth. So on the third floor was done um, some carton. The carton means that you take the material, the wall, and make sure that it doesn't have any knots inside of it. You cart it. That means get rid of the knots out of the fiber that you look, you're dealing with that day. And then you come down to the second floor and you would weave your material. You have to make a blanket, a large blanket since it's for a horse. And so you already carted material, it's very smooth. And you would weave it together uh, with the, we, the weave and the weft. That means you, you, you have it uh, weaved together from both directions. And in the first floor, you would finish off the production. Now, each floor basically would have these things going on. You would have the carding, the weaving, and spinning, and then the finishing the ground floor. So mill number one, two, and three on the right-hand side were all doing the same thing. Now, in the middle, there was a, a band that where you had more storage of materials that were needed to do these equipment be stored chemicals some of the materials the raw materials that you needed to build up this uh, blanket such as the wool or the cotton now mill the mill on the left hand side attached to the band and back was called mill number four in this mill instead of being three floors high like the one on the right was only two floors high and what what it did was um, the, the same thing, except you do you do it on the top floor. You do your carding, and then on the bottom floor you do your weaving. And there was no finishing being done here, and so the finishing would be able to be brought into another building to do that. So if they had built it three floors high, they would have all three at once. Now, all these things require other steps, but the other steps are done off the raw material and the one very interesting one that people like to hear about is the pickers. The pickers were such that they'd have to either do one of two things. If it were wool they'd have to pick it off the skin of the animal and that was done in a little uh, part of the building the very back left. Uh, if it were cotton they were trying to get they'd have to if it were off of rags they'd have to pick the rag apart to take only the good carton pieces. If it were raw cotton, they'd have to pick it off, um, uh, pick out some of the seeds that were in the raw cotton. So all these little components were all blended together as best they can to make the finished material. And they'd keep it in the back storage room, so I call it a stock room, until it was ready to ship out on the railroads. So there you have a company just doing it over and over again. Remember, they made a million blankets a year. This was the biggest horse blanket company in the United States. And so what happened to this mill? Okay. There's precious little left. You can guess what happened. By the late 1920s, people were using mostly cars and not uh, horses anymore. Of course, there was still some need, but to have such a big factory around making less blankets was not cost efficient. 
And so they ended up selling out their materials. I don't know when most of the mill was taken down. There's still a little part of it left, probably used by the Snorkel Paper Company that's still in Royal. And so a piece of this history is there. I've never seen a blanket that they made. I wish I could see one somewhere. I, I'm pretty sure they made horse blankets for all types of uses. Now Warren Wilson loved his show horses, so he probably made blankets for those race horses, or shore horses, or jumping horses. But yeah, of course, he also made them for people that traveled with the horses, or work horses, so there must be all kinds around. I wonder if some of the ones that were, for, that were show horses blanket are still around because they probably had less use. And that would be great to have around Hoyle to see some of this history. So thank you, Robert, for educating us on your tours. And I want to thank our listeners for tuning in. You can also tune in to a large selection of our other podcasts and much more at his website. Again, that's HoyleCanalTour.org. And again, you can email him directly for private tours or to inquire about anything else at Bobcat4214, capital B, at Yahoo.com. And be sure to keep an eye out for his upcoming 2024 season tours and more as they become available. Thank you for tuning in.